is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you uh, Professor Eric Weiner, who doesn't need a long introduction. He's Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He's a Chief of the Breast Section at the Dana-Farber. He has been Chair of the Alliance Group. He's a wonderful mentor, collaborator, and he has a unique talent at dissecting results from clinical trials and transposing them to daily clinical practice. And I think his success relates to the fact that he speaks to our heart and not only to our brain because he's truly patient focused. So Eric, tell us everything about adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy, principles and practical considerations. All right, well, um, thank you, Martine. I appreciate that. And I'm sorry to all of you because you have to listen to me tomorrow morning too, so you shouldn't have to put up with this now. But um, I was given this big topic and that made me feel like I could talk about anything I wanted to. So let's see how this goes. Uh, here are my disclosures. And here are the topics that I'm going to consider. I want to talk about briefly the goals of adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy, the relative merits of the adjuvant versus the neoadjuvant approach, the surgical advantages associated with neoadjuvant therapy. I'm going to take a very brief detour into neoadjuvant endocrine therapy, which others have touched on. And then we're going to talk about the meaning of a pathologic complete response and the hope that neoadjuvant therapy can lead to individualization and improved outcomes. So when we think about the goals of adjuvant therapy, they're really quite straightforward. To eradicate micrometastatic disease and improve overall survival. We often look at disease-free survival or distant disease-free survival, and these are useful measures if they are good surrogates for overall survival, or if the delay in recurrence, even without a survival prolongation, leads to better overall quality of life after accounting for the toxicity of treatment since ultimately it all comes to how long and how well we all live. With neoadjuvant therapy, of course, we're still trying to eradicate micrometastatic disease and improve survival. It's the same treatment given before versus after most of the time. But we're also trying to decrease the extent of surgery, provide prognostic information, identify candidates for a different treatment approaches, which you've heard about over the past few days, potentially to test de-escalation trials, uh, de-escalation de strategies in trials, and conduct tissue intensive trials. Is there a survival difference between adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy? I think the simple answer is, at this point, no. This was published a number of years ago and represents the NSABP experience in their B18 and B27 trials. B18, which was truly a visionary study when started now about three decades ago, compared surgery followed by four cycles of AC with AC followed by surgery. The hypothesis was that patients who received chemotherapy first would actually have a better outcome as a result of not perturbing the tumor. That turned out not to be the case. The survival and disease-free survival uh, outcomes were identical. In B27, there were three arms, but importantly, two of the arms were either four cycles of AC before surgery or four cycles of AC followed by four cycles of docetaxel before surgery. Adding docetaxel doubled the pathologic complete response rate, but in spite of that, there was no difference in long-term outcome. And there has been a meta-analysis, albeit not a huge meta-analysis, consisting of just uh, under 4,000 patients that looked at pre- versus post-operative chemotherapy and essentially showed no difference in outcome. Now, given the fact that survival is the same, it's worth spending a few minutes talking about when adjuvant therapy uh, is preferred, and this I would call surgery first. So if the decisions about therapy depend on the anatomic extent of disease, and particularly if you don't need um, some type of therapy to reduce the size of the tumor or improve the surgical options, uh, 
then in fact, surgery is the right way to go. This is true for most early stage cancers, for patients with stage one HER2 positive disease. As you know, we can give a much easier chemotherapy regimen than we would give for patients who have stage two or three disease, but we need to know the anatomic extent of disease. The same is probably true in triple negative disease, where many of you would not give an anthracycline and taxane-based regimen to a patient who has the smallest of all tumors, whether you call that T1A, T1B, or all stage one. And finally, in ER positive disease, let's talk about both stage one and stage two ER positive disease that's intermediate grade. In this situation, we often use genomic profiles to try to help make decisions about adjuvant therapy, but particularly when those profiles don't give us such clear answers, the anatomic extent of disease may influence your decisions in clinical practice. I think when it's impossible to follow what's going on in the breast, either because it's, it's not palpable or imaging is, for whatever reasons, very poor. It's hard to get excited about neoadjuvant therapy. And I'll acknowledge that there are going to be situations when you will decide to do surgery first, and you will find more disease in the breast or the lymph nodes than you initially thought would be there, and you may regret it. But this isn't common, and it doesn't change my approach to the situations above. What about neoadjuvant therapy? Well, I think for many of us, Patients who have stage two or three triple negative breast cancer or HER2 positive disease are probably optimally treated um, with the neoadjuvant approach, and we'll get into many of the reasons in just a few minutes. For that matter, a woman who has ER positive and HER2 negative disease, if it is clear that she's going to get chemotherapy, might as well get that chemotherapy up front too. Um, and finally, if optimal surgical therapy, as I previously mentioned, will be facilitated by neoadjuvant therapy, then that's the approach you want to take, whatever that neoadjuvant therapy is. But I think there is one twist, and that is to be successful giving neoadjuvant therapy, you really need to have a multidisciplinary team that is actually adequately functioning, because surgeons and medical oncologists and radiation oncologists um, need to be able to talk to one another and communicate about the patient. Now, in spite of the fact that we saw no difference in the studies that have been done in terms of survival, I think there is one nagging issue, and, and that is whether there are subsets of patients for whom delays in the administration of treatment, and specifically chemotherapy, may be problematic. And this perhaps applies to triple negative patients more than to any other group. Clearly, starting with chemotherapy minimizes the issue, and this is almost certainly a bigger problem for underserved women, some of whom may undergo surgery and then never make their way to see a medical oncologist afterwards and receive no additional therapy. And there are data to support this. There are actually a number of studies that have looked at treatment delays, um, particularly in the, the um, ER negative or triple negative setting. Shown on the left is the experience at the British Columbia, Columbia Cancer Registry, a total of 2,954 patients, about half of whom had ER negative disease. And as you can see, an interval from surgery to the start of treatment of 12 to 24 weeks seemed to uh, lead to a worse outcome. MD Anderson, or the MD Anderson group, also did a review of, of uh, their database identifying 889 patients with triple negative disease and suggesting that for those who had treatment within 30 days, the outcome was better. Let's now talk a little bit about the impact on local therapy and specifically surgery. This now is back to NSABP B18, and this is looking at the group of women in B18 who received AC and then had surgery. As you can see, for patients who had T1 and T tumors, so less than uh, two centimeters or less, or 2.1 to five, that the number of women who were thought to be eligible for lumpectomy and the number who had lumpectomies performed were almost identical to one another. Now, the caveat here, of course, is some of those women who were proposed for lumpectomy might not have actually been able to have a lumpectomy, 
um, they might have had persistently positive margins, for example, um, if they had not received chemotherapy first. But it's hard to get excited about the dramatic increase in breast conservation in these patients. In patients who had T3 tumors, there was a modest improvement in the number of women who, who were able to undergo lumpectomies, about a 20% improvement. Monica Morrow and Terry King have reviewed a number of studies um, and, uh, and looked at both pathologic complete response rates um, and breast conservation rates. And in each of these four trials that I have listed on the bottom, there was an improvement with the investigational arm in the pathologic complete response rate. In some cases, for example, in the NeoAlto uh, trial, essentially a doubling of the pathologic complete response rate, and that is shown in the solid bars. But as you can see in the striped bars, the difference in, in terms of breast conservation was much, much more modest. In ACASOG Z1071, there were a total of 694 patients. Not surprisingly, women who had hormone receptor positive HER2 negative disease had a 16% pathologic complete response rate, which was about a third of what was seen in women with HER2 positive or triple negative disease. And yet, the uh, frequency of breast conservation, while a little lower in the hormone receptor positive HER2 negative group, was not dramatically different. So why do many patients with excellent responses and even pathologic complete response, responses undergo mastectomies? Well, I think there are a number of potential answers. There's patient anxiety and bias. There's physician bias and anxiety. <laughs> there are patients who have multifocal disease at presentation and simply may not be eligible, even if they have a pathologic complete response, which you don't know they've had before you do the surgery, um, to undergo conservative surgery. There's the problem of diffuse calcifications that simply cannot be cleared by conservative surgery. And this is particularly an issue in the context of HER2 positive disease, rarely an issue in triple negative disease where we, where we do still see very high rates of mastectomy even in patients who have a pathologic complete response. And finally, and I don't know that this is, it's, it's hard to call this a problem, but we don't have perfect imaging. If we had imaging that told us whether someone had a pathologic complete response, this would be much easier. Um, in ACASOG Z1071, they also asked whether not only could you do less surgery in the breast, could you do less surgery to the axilla? So a total of 637 patients who had node positive disease at presentation were treated with uh, neoadjuvant therapy. 40% of those patients converted to a clinical N0 status. The sentinel biopsy identified the correct axillary node status in 91% of patients. The false negative rate, if three or more sentinel nodes were examined, was 9%. And there are three similar trials that have reported quite similar results. And I think this study and the other studies raise the question about what the appropriate local therapy, not just to the breast but to the regional lymph nodes is, in patients who have excellent responses to preoperative therapy. And there are randomized trials going on at the moment, both in the US and outside of the US, addressing these questions. I want to take a very brief detour into preoperative endocrine therapy. Um, this looks at another ACASOG study. This was a study that was led by Matthew Ellis and looked at three different aromatase inhibitors in the neoadjuvant setting administered for six months. You will not be surprised to hear that they all performed the same. So the, they were all brought together and analyzed together, at least on this slide. Um, and all of these patients were either considered to be marginal candidates for breast conservation or candidates for modified radical mastectomy only. And what you can see is that for those patients who had a, a marginal status at the outset, 
78% of them were actually able to undergo breast conservation. And for those patients who were candidates only for a mastectomy initially, 42% of them had conservative surgery. So if anything, preoperative endocrine therapy appeared to be quite effective in downstaging the tumor, far less effective in terms of producing a pathologic complete response either in the breast or in the axilla. Um, but this is clearly a treatment to keep in mind. And when should it be considered? At least from my perspective, this is a treatment for patients who are generally not considered to have chemotherapy sensitive disease and when your inclination at the outset is that you're probably not going to give chemotherapy at all. It is best done to optimize breast conservation for stage two and three disease. There is the potential to assess prognosis through assessments of, of measurements such as KI-67 or other markers uh, to determine the need for chemotherapy. And this, of course, was, was suggested in the POETIC study. Though in my mind, in average clinical practice, this is still investigational. If you're going to give endocrine therapy, be prepared to follow people closely and be prepared to treat them for six months or longer because that is the amount of time that it takes to see an optimal response. And I think the big question many of us have as we await the results of adjuvant trials is how the CDK4-6 inhibitors will fit in. So now let's turn and talk about the meaning of a pathologic complete response. Is there a consistent correlation between a higher PATH-CR rate and improvement in event-free and overall survival in trials? Is there a consistent correlation between PATH-CR and outcome for the individual patient? And if these questions lead to different answers, and I think many of you know that they do, and I will tell you that they do, it seems counterintuitive. Can these answers really be different? So first, let's go to the meta-analysis that was done by Patricia Kodazar and published in The Lancet in 2014, where she looked at a large number of neoadjuvant trials. And what you can see is that the PATH-CR rate, which I showed you uh, earlier in, in an ACOSARG trial, varies greatly according to the disease subtype and the treatment. For patients with hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative disease shown on the far left, those who had grade one or two disease were very unlikely to have a pathologic complete response, doubled if the disease was grade three. In the HER2 positive setting with chemotherapy alone, there is a modest complete response rate, pathologic complete response rate, um, uh, higher in the hormone receptor negative than the hormone receptor positive population. But of course, this jumps way up to 50%, for example, in the group of patients who had ER negative HER2 positive disease when trastuzumab is added. And here, the, in this analysis, the, the pathologic complete response in triple negative patients was about one in three, and it has ranged from 30 to 45% across trials. But unfortunately, in these trials that have tested one regimen versus another, where the second regimen, the investigational regimen, had a higher PATH-CR rate, this has not consistently, or even commonly, or even hardly ever led to an improvement in event-free or overall survival. So in these two graphs shown on the y-axis, is the event-free survival hazard ratio on the x-axis is the pathologic complete response rate odds ratio. If there were a clear and consistent relationship between PATH-CR and long-term outcome, that red line would be on the diagonal. The higher the odds ratio, the higher would be the event-free survival ratio. And what you can see is essentially circles of varying sizes depending on the trial scattered across the map. And I'm going to show you now very briefly a number of trials that have demonstrated this. So first we have the NEO-ALTO trial where there was essentially a doubling of the pathologic complete response rate from 25% to 51% when trastuzumab and lapatinib was given with paclitaxel. <coughs> 
And as my colleague Dr. Prakar knows well, um, in spite of that result, the overall result from the adjuvant alto study was one where there was a very small numeric advantage that was not statistically significant, at least based on the way the statistical uh, plan was designed for this trial. About the same can be said in terms of the experience with pertuzumab, although it's not something we'd really like to admit. So in the Neosphere study, the addition of pertuzumab um, led to almost a doubling of the pathologic complete response rate. And in ER negative patients, those who received THP had a 63% pathologic complete response rate. Technically, Affinity was a statistically significant study. Um, it led to an approval. But as you all know, the added benefit for pertuzumab in the majority of patients was quite small. Not something that we don't give. We do give it, some more selectively than others. But it was hardly as striking as what we saw in Neosphere. The one trial where there has been a clear relationship between pathologic complete response and long-term outcome is the NOAA trial done in patients with HER2 positive locally advanced breast cancer where there was a doubling of the pathologic complete response um, and a long-term benefit. And in, in this study, I think what's different is that a very different treatment a, in a biologic anti-HER2 treatment was added for the first time to chemotherapy. And just to complete this series of trials, the same has been seen in triple negative disease. Here with bevacizumab, Jepar Quinto showed a benefit for preoperative bevacizumab. We saw a similar result in the study led by Bill Sykov in the CLGB 40103. But in spite of these results, um, the Beatrice study, which was conducted um, in patients with triple negative disease, many of whom had no negative disease, um, and the ECOG study, which was conducted in a more mixed group of patients, but a higher proportion of node positive patients, failed to show a benefit for bevacizumab. Now, in spite of what we've seen in clinical trials, and, and in spite of the fact that on a trial level, there is not a correlation between an improvement in pathologic complete response that is consistent and long-term outcome, on an individual patient basis, pathologic complete response is a powerful biomarker. And in fact, both event-free and overall survival are substantially higher for patients who have a pathologic response than those who don't. This has also not only been shown in, in Dr. Kodazar's uh, meta-analysis that I just showed you, but was recently reported about 15 months ago at San Antonio in iSpy2. And here, this is the entire population in iSpy2, and what you can see is both event-free survival and distant recurrence-free survival were substantially higher for patients who achieved a pathologic complete response versus those who didn't. 94 and 95 percent at three years was, was the, the uh, event-free survival and distant uh, relapse-free survival compared to a, a 79 and 76 percent. This was seen even more dramatically in patients with triple negative disease where the failure to obtain a pathologic complete response in this setting led to an even worse outcome. And almost surprisingly, but maybe not, it was also seen in hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative disease. We're typically used to thinking of failure to achieve a pathologic response pathologic complete response in patients with ER positive disease as being somewhat less dire, and typically it is. But the difference here is that all of these patients had mammoprint high ER positive disease. So these are patients with high grade ER positive disease, which may be more sensitive to the effects of, uh, of chemotherapy. So how do we reconcile the individual patient data with the trial outcomes? And bear with me while we go through a thought experiment. I, uh, forgive me if, in fact, you've heard me do this before. 
So let's take a standard treatment. Um, and the pathologic CR rate is 25%. Of those 25% of patients, 90% are cured, 10% relapse. Of the patients who don't have a PCR, all those patients don't relapse. In fact, about 30% do and 70% are cured. Now let's take a new treatment. You've added some drug or substituted a drug and this new treatment now has a pathologic complete response rate of 50%. And the key is, who are those 25% of women who in fact have now achieved a pathologic complete response rate? Are they from the 70% in the, uh, in, uh, who were re receiving the standard treatment who would have been cured or are they from the 30% who would have relapsed? And the improvement will only lead to a better event-free, disease-free survival if these patients come from the 30% from the who are ultimately destined to relapse. So my interpretation is that pathologic com uh, complete response is clearly associated with a better outcome for the individual uh, patient, but the relationship be between PCR and a favorable outcome actually is an association. It's not a causal relationship. And PCR is by no means required to achieve a favorable outcome. And this is even more so now that we have studies like the Catherine study. So Catherine took patients who did not achieve a pathologic complete response, substituted TDM1 for trastuzumab, and demonstrated an 11% uh, improvement in invasive disease-free survival. Now, accompanying the official publication of Catherine in the New England Journal was a commentary from some of our colleagues at the FDA, and I'm just going to read you a selected portion. Although individual patients with a PATH-CR have substantially lower risk of recurrence or death than those found at surgery to have residual invasive cancer, the PATH-CR rate has not been validated as a trial-level surrogate for event-free or overall survival. The results of the Catherine trial and the physical, financial, and logistic challenges of simply adding new agents to conventional regimens preoperatively should prompt us to investigate additional strategies for introducing new agents into the treatment of early-stage breast cancer. If I were a company, I would look at this and say there aren't going to be a lot of approvals in the United States based on pathologic complete response alone, and recognize they were only accelerated approvals. And I've been saying this for a little while, but I found the right picture. I think we need to stop praying at the altar of the pathologic complete response. So, in my mind, it's time for a new approach for clinical trials in the neoadjuvant setting. We should, maybe not always, but generally put the brakes on looking for better regimens, higher path CR rates that to date have not led to clinically significant improvements in what really matters to patients, which is event-free and overall survival. Instead, we should maximize the biologic insights from neoadjuvant trials, explore ways in which we can de-escalate therapy by considering the importance of pathologic complete response as a powerful biomarker for the individual patient, no matter how it's achieved. And in the absence of PCR, we can pursue salvage regimens both on and off trial. If we decide to give not the entire regimen, but part of the regimen to see if we can identify a group of patients who may achieve a pathologic complete response with less, for those who don't, we can complete the standard therapy. We can use new regimens such as TDM1, and perhaps um, the part that is most exciting is we can look at novel therapies beyond the ones we've already identified in these relatively high-risk patients. So imagine this design. You take a target population. I think the obvious one is patients with HER2 positive disease, but it doesn't have to be that population and you use a highly active therapy. Some of those patients have a pathologic complete response, and at that point, they are simply followed. I suppose if it's in the HER2 setting, they continue antibodies, but don't get more chemotherapy. A reasonable number of patients don't have a PATH-CR. They can have comprehensive tissue and blood collection and analysis. 
and be randomized to standard treatment or an experimental treatment, that particular randomized potentially phase three trial can be much smaller than the standard phase three trial because the group of patients who you're studying have a higher event rate. And the ultimate sample size will depend on the confidence intervals you want to, want to put on the phase two study. The phase two study is for the patients who have the PATH-CR um, and the assumptions that, that are built around the phase three trial in patients with residual disease. An optimal result from such a study would be de-escalation of therapy for some, escalation of therapy for those with residual disease, development of even more effective escalation approaches, and importantly, biologic insights to differentiate patient populations and design tailored treatments. And I'm very happy to say that ECOG and the Alliance are together working on such a design referred to uh, as the COMPASS trial. It's taken long enough to work on this that my colleagues have, have long given it a name. And uh, Antonio Wolf and, and Angie D. Michelle and Lisa Carey and Ann Partridge and others have been hard at work on this within the, the US groups. Um, and in this study, patients who have stage two and three HER2 positive disease will receive THP. If they have a pathologic complete response, they will receive antibody therapy alone. If they don't, they will be randomized to one of uh, a couple of different treatments. So in summary, adjuvant and neoadjuvant therapy um, show equal results, at least at this point in time, in terms of survival. In general, most stage one patients and a substantial proportion of stage two uh, ER positive HER2 negative patients should have surgery first. We have not taken full advantage of the local therapy improvements that we can potentially see in the context of neoadjuvant treatment. Pathologic complete response certainly is important, but it, it is a strong predictor for the individual patient and a pretty poor predictor of long-term success of a regimen in terms of uh, event-free and overall survival. New approaches to escalation and de-escalation, which we're all interested, both escalation and de-escalation, can be anchored in neoadjuvant trials leading to smaller biologically driven trials. I want to thank my many colleagues at my home institution or institutions um, who are really an amazing group to work with. And thank all of you for listening. Appreciate it.